I'm Mina Malik Hussain and you're watching The Coffee Table. And today we've got a real cracker of a show for you because we are going to be looking at our post-colonial experiences as Pakistanis, but also from a really unique and different angle. So joining me today on set is Gulmeher Jalani and Lauren Louise McCartney, who are both final year fine art students at Newcastle University who are in town working on a really special project. And now we're going to tell you about it. So, <laughs> hi guys. Hi. Welcome. Yeah. Hi. Thank you for being on set. Thank you. Welcome Thank you. to Pakistan, Lauren. This Thank is your you. first time. Yep. It's yeah, really great. <laughs> well, you know, in the heat and the monsoon, and it's like the best time to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Just a bit warmer than Ireland. <laughs> well, that's a relief. <laughs> so, guys, tell me, um, you guys are doing fine art. And now you're here making a documentary film on partition experiences. Now this is like, for me, it's super fascinating because for Pakistanis and Indians, the, the, sub, the partition of the subcontinent was this massive monumental um, event in our historical um, consciousness. But at the same time, uh, Lauren, you are from Northern Ireland. And there's a great, and Ireland has a history of partition as well. Yeah. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Because I think a lot of Pakistanis, at least, aren't that familiar with uh, Irish history and their experience with colonialism. Yeah. So um, Ireland was used to be in British rule. Okay. And then um, they fought. Mm -hmm. So the British only took six counties at okay. the very top, which was made Northern Ireland. Right. Um, and that was the partition. Um, but troubles kind of arose. Um, there was a division between Northern Ireland with Protestants and Catholics mm. and there was a Catholic civil rights movement mm -hmm. which the Brit Brit British didn't take too well um, as they thought it was a revolution to become a uh, United Ireland. Ah, okay. um, so like unrest kind of mm. grew. So what was, um, was, was essentially a religious um, conflict between yeah. Catholics and Protestants had mm -hmm. the potential to become something much larger, yes. and that was worrisome for the British. Yes. So familiar, like, who knew? <laughs> like, we've never heard of that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, the, like, the 1970s was where it kind of, like, mm -hmm. the violence started and troops were sent in. Um, this kind of continued on, and the Good Friday Agreement, which was, like, a peace treaty, mm -hmm. was only signed in 1998. So it's really, really recent. 1998? Yeah. Wow, that is very recent. Yeah. Mm. Um, For something that's been going on from the 70s. And uh, tensions was growing mm. way before that, but that's just when it kind of erupted. Right. Um, so yeah, like only 1998 is when the peace treaty um, happened. And then there was a decade of like unrest trying to move past it. Mm. And now it passed like since 2010. Um, there was a real change in dynamic and everything was moving really peacefully. Right. But now with the looming of Brexit yes. and the uncertainty, like uh, Northern Ireland's not being taken in account of mm. again. <laughs> so. so to ignore it, really. So mm -hmm. what essentially that is, is that Ireland proper is independent and Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom. Yes. So that means that the British are the ones, the British government is essentially the one who's supposed to be sort of looking after Northern Ireland. Yes. And they're not very diligent about it. No. In my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really interesting because during uh, the partition of the subcontinent, as I'm sure Gulmeher you know, because your family is also from Punjab, as is mine, um, the province of Punjab was also split into yep. two. So half of it went to India and half of it went to Pakistan, much like Ireland, mm -hmm. where there's just a line sort of drawn between this perfectly sort of functional and more or less, I think, united space. So, um, Gunhara, tell me, uh, as art students, how is this sort of, how did you guys find this link because traditionally or sort of more commonly partitions and, and the post-colonial experience are seem to be sort of subjects that historians and anthropologists or sociologists sort of generally tend to look at. You know, you talk to people, you want to see the effect on it socially and things like that. But you guys are art students. Yeah. That, how did that happen? So there was two main reasons. One of them is as a British Pakistani, I've mm. kind of been brought up on both sides of yes. um, the conflict. Mm. Um, so in, within our generation, second, third generations of um, overseas Pakistanis, 
we have been made aware of like the trauma that like our ancestors, our forefathers went through um, during the migration, during the like um, the violence. Yes, and the, violence. Just the partition was a terrible and traumatic experience for people on both sides of yeah. this new border. And yes. everybody has a story. Yes. Everyone's family has a story. Yes. Is is it like that? Uh, for you guys in Northern Ireland, where you know you have family that lives in Ireland, and some of you are sort of now in Northern Ireland, is there that kind of sort of exchange also? Um, yeah, everyone has a story, but mostly mm. it's kind of just the violence in Northern Ireland. Okay. Um, I felt like the most different um, in our journeys is I find out a lot of people have lost family members in India, even if they survived, they don't really know who they are. Yeah. Um, for me and for Northern Ireland, we were lucky enough to have eventually like a soft border that mm. we could go mm. and find um, families and it was quite open. That's quite crucial and I, I imagine that that kind of um, helps the trauma of separation if there is a possibility of return. And a lot of people during our partition thought that they could return. Yep. And a lot of people thought that this was just temporary and that they could sort of pack up their stuff and go to Pakistan, but then maybe return after a month or a few weeks. And that's why a lot of people um, just left everything behind. Yeah. Because half of it was, I, I imagine half of it was sort of ardor and this fervency to be part of this brave new world. Yeah, exactly. And some of it was just not really being fully informed about it. I think because during the partition and those very chaotic few months mm. in the summer of 1947, Everything was happening so fast that yeah. um, people were like, okay, at one point they thought, oh, we're going to come back. At another point they were like, we can't come back, we're going to be killed. Mm -hmm. So there was like the, the fervor of wanting to be part of this amazing new nation that we've paved the way yeah. for, our, um, for our faith, for this like homeland that's for just freedom. for freedom, mm. for our, so we can practice um, our religion freely. Um, at, and at the same time, I think there was this very very strong terror and fear of being just too late to get there mm -hmm. because as the violence escalated yes. uh, the murder the separation everything was was um increasing so there was like this desperation to just get there like we're as soon as we're on the other mm -hmm. side of the border mm -hmm. we're going to be free we're going to be happy and we'll be safe we'll be safe. yes exactly mm -hmm. and um what we actually recently found out was during the first 16, 18 years of like after the partition, mm -hmm. there wasn't any um, like blockade between India and Pakistan if people oh. wanted to go mm. in between. And for as long as sort of a decade and a half. Yeah, exactly. That's a long time. That's a long time. Mm. And considering how violent 1947 was, yes. um, it's quite a nice perspective that even after that, even after so much, with, yeah. so much bloodshed and so much trauma and so much violence. Yeah. There wasn't this sort of lingering desire for revenge as yeah. such. That, yeah. you know, I will never go back and I don't belong there anymore. Yeah. And so much, ter so many terrible things have happened that yes, I can't exactly. return. But people did return and it was a sort of fairly porous back and forth. Yeah, there was definitely some back and forth during mm. the initial years. Mm. Kaide Azam actually said that he wanted the relationship between Pakistan and India to be like that of Canada and America. Mm. Mm. Like the obviously two separate countries, yeah. but they have this dialogue, ongoing dialogue. Yeah. Um, but when the na Hindu national extremists found out about this um, like dialogue for peace, they uh, plotted against it. They obviously... Sort of they actively assassinated. subverted that because yes, it yes. obviously didn't suit them for yes. this sort of accord to exist. They started the terrorist acts assassinating yeah. Gandhi, yeah. Um, kind of, and then this propelled to the conflicts in the 60s and the 70s. Mm. And then I just feel like we've never recovered that chance at friendship since then. Mm. And then ongoing conflicts, even to this day, such as the one that's happening in Kashmir yes. now, such a controversial event that's ongoing, happening right at this moment. And again, it's sort of this really sad irony that you're working on a project about partition and people being separated. And now we have this very current situation, yeah. which is very similar yes. to it. So tell me more about your project. And because I know that it's a film and you guys are interviewing people here in, in Pakistan and in Lahore and sort of cities yes. around. Um, and then you're also going to, is there a parallel 
I'm, I'm sure there's a parallel that, you, that mm -hmm. you're drawing between here and the Irish experience. So you're going to be interviewing people there as well? Yes, that's mm -hmm. the plan. So we were actually awarded a scholarship to come um, here. Um, ah, to, well done. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. To be able to interview people. We're really interested in the personal stories. Mm. Uh, and as Gull talked about, like the fact that these stories were passed down yeah. verbally, mm. um, and it's just the really important aspect. So as like artist, we find it quite important to kind of put that take on it, and not just this is the facts. Yeah. Right. This has affected these mm. people, and like this trauma is still here. Mm. Um, in uh, around uh, Christmas time, Gull's coming to Northern Ireland, so we hope to do <laughs> the same there. Yeah. So that's and that's really beautiful because it's history happens, but yeah. then it happens to people, and yes. that's the story that's really there to tell within our own art mm. practices. I think a lot of mm. questions that we've been getting is, "But your art students, so why are you making a film? Yes. Like, why are you making a documentary?" Mm. I think it's really important to like highlight that for us, art is about connecting to people mm. and translating their stories, and most importantly, giving them their own narrative. Mm -hmm. that they can take it and they can tell their story how they felt it yeah. rather than how it was dictated to them. And whose version of history has made it to textbooks? Of course, it's yeah. co uh, colonization of British India, Ireland. Obviously, the British Empire colonized a lot of land um, during their peak time and they definitely grasped the narrative quite early on. Yeah. And yeah. To, this day, to this day, we've talk, we think a lot about how we're grateful for certain things in Pakistan. Yes, yes, we are. Um, we have the railways, yeah. and we have a postal system, but they're actually just sort of remnants yeah. of an oppressive regime yes. that put that in place just to make it easier for them to take more from us. Even and we're just going to cut to a quick break and more on this when you return. So come back soon. Hi, welcome back to The Coffee Table. We're having a really fascinating conversation about a really diverse colonial experience and what two artists are doing to help bring the humanity back to our trauma. So guys, uh, we were talking about oral histories. And it's really interesting because um, I know that um, for families, and most families, most Pakistani families do have uh, people who came across from India. And there are a lot of stories of survival and a lot of stories of, of what happened. Right? And those are things that have sort of become part of family histories and passed down from generations. So we have grandparents and their siblings and, you know, sort of grandparents or friends and so on and so forth, where people, everybody has their sort of different kind of stories. So is it like that in Northern Ireland as well? Um, in my experience, it's mm. not as much as like one, like whole story you get at yeah. points. It kind of just comes up naturally every day, just really? in a normal dialect, mm. like, it would be, my mum would be telling me about my dad's old job and how she used to be really stressed every day, just in passing comments. Yeah. And the one thing that I'm, I really love about Northern Ireland is they've kept the humour that they've always had, and it's like they just have humour about it now. If you, mm. like, we always say you either laugh or cry about it, so that's something that they've kind of kept. That, uh, the trans it, so it's sort of like a coping mechanism, but it's really yeah. interesting how you're saying that the sort of an ongoing experience of violence has kind of becomes part of your daily vocabulary and mm -hmm. your daily kind of anecdotal recall, yeah. as it were. But I don't think that over on this side, you feel like it's not as frequent. It, it's not something that people talk about as a sort of passing yeah. reference. Yeah, it's a casual conversation. Mm -hmm. It's definitely, as a child, I'd always love to talk to my grandparents and be like, tell me stories of when you were young. And naturally, the partition was a massive, yeah. it shaped their lives massively. Mm -hmm. So they would always, um, like we're, we're sitting in one room, we're all gathered around. It was, all, it was always a very casual setting. Mm. And they would tell these stories and everybody would be mesmerized. And I think I shared this with you a lot, with Lauren a lot, that that very f familial atmosphere that was created, mm. um, we're looking at our history as a nation. But also one thing that really fascinates me is that every single person that is in Pakistan has been affected by the partition. And every single person, you can go up to anybody in the street and just ask them, can you please tell me a story about mm. your family? Did they migrate? And they all have a story. And it's so important that these stories are um, represented and translated into writing, film, photography, any kind of medium. And that's where it feeds into our work as well as art students. 
we've been doing some filming, some interviews, taking pictures, doing some writing, just trying to bring to light these, these lost, these small stories that have been lost within the bigger um, narrative of trying to get the facts down. Yeah. There's always been such a focus on the economic um, reparations and mm. the geography of it and stuff. There's n never been a focus on what did you lose in this event and... And how you sort of define loss as well. Yeah. And how you come to terms with that very permanent sense of loss. Yeah. A lot of people could never go back yes. home. And it's, it's, really, it's, it's really sad. And, and I find that um, wanting to talk about it, and like you said, there's, there's trauma there. And it's a sort of, it's an immense trauma. And you know, like a lot of psychologists, right, have written about this and how trauma gets passed down yes. through generations. Yeah. And as very new Pakistanis, um, we're third generation Pakistanis who yeah. are now raising a fourth generation. It's, that's pretty new, I think, in the yeah, grand definitely. scheme of things definitely. as far as history goes. That's pretty new. So what you see is sort of, and also the, a lot of the people who experience partition firsthand have now passed on. Yes. So do you think that sort of makes the project even more urgent? I think so, because when I was talking a little bit about being an overseas Pakistani, yeah. there's this, um, in the art sense, and in the literary sense, there's the diaspora, mm. and there's like people who are abroad, but they have a South Asian heritage. Yeah. In this climate and economy, they're finding it a lot more urgent to connect to those roots. Mm -hmm. And because I think we live among the colonizers, so to speak. Yeah. It's a little bit more... We all do. <laughs> it's a little... well, I don't. <laughs> there's, that, mm. there's a little bit of a change from perspective from mm. people in Pakistan. Yeah. They see the partition and the colonial period, the colonial subjugation from a different lens than we do. Mm -hmm. And it's not about who knows better. It's, it's just... Everyone's more experience exposed. of it yeah. is different. Yeah. Mm. So I just feel like we felt like it was very urgent and important to come to Pakistan and talk to people who live in the country and especially mm. we've been talking to a few people who were alive during the partition and just giving them the respect that they deserve for experiencing that and going through something mm. like that. I think that's really special, the sort of the, as the, the idea of bearing witness also. But you can't do anything about it now. Yeah. It's happened yeah. and even by recording it, it's, it's bearing witness that this is what has happened. I see you and we will not forget. Yeah. And do you think there's that same sort of sense in Ireland about that as well? It's sort of a, remembering violence is traumatic, but that's also the only way to move sort on. of move commemorate on. what has happened, yeah. accept it, and then move, move on. on. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, and it was a long process for Northern Ireland to come to terms with that and move on. Um, it just seems to be now undermined with the uncertainty of Brexit, and that could just, a lot of the Brexit plans could uh, just disregard the Good Friday Agreement, yeah. which completely takes away our, um, like, our right. yeah. independence. Yeah. Sort of operating within the larger sort of British governmental scheme, Northern Ireland still had sort of space to be, mm -hmm. do its own thing, so to speak. With with the Good Friday Agreement, um, the people of Northern Ireland could choose to uh, identify as British or Irish mm. or both. Or both, okay. Um, and now with the Brexit, we might have an ultimatum which may lead, and hopefully not, to like the rise of violence again. Because you're taking away people's identities. Mm. Because then they'll be forced to be what? Just British? Or just... Or just Irish? Um, but yes, we are, it's still uncertain if you can mm. classify yourself mm. as you, you could make the move to be just Irish and yeah. stay in Northern Ireland. It's still quite unclear, mm. just like a lot. That's, that's interesting. And again, duality. Mm -hmm. that, that's interesting as well, because you know, you are an overseas Pakistani, but you, you're British. We were born yeah. and raised there. Yeah. So that's very much part of who you are as a person. And then you've got this, this Pakistani identity. And with you guys, there is an Irish cultural and historical heritage. And then there's also this sort of overarching ge geographical political situation of identifying as British. And do you think that that also contributes to this kind of sense of being pulled in two directions? Definitely. We've talked, we've had a lot of conversations about our own work and mm. the thing that drew us together yeah. as friends and colleagues is that there is this ongoing identity crisis. It's, one of the, yeah. it's the name of one of her films, Identity Crisis, <laughs> literally. It's appropriate. <laughs> um, 
and it's it's manifests in our work a lot. And then when we looked at wanting to do this project and come to Pakistan and go to Northern Ireland, we, we wanted to include even more um, dualities within mm. themes of colonialism, imperialism, mm. trauma, suffering. Um, so the one thing that separates these two events, the partitions of both countries, yes. is that the Pakistani partition is obviously old and it's been done and there is nothing we can do about it, like you said. Mm. It's permanent. It's a permanent, mm. it's already a fixture in our history. Yes. But because I feel like there's not been enough representation about the emotional and the more humane aspect of it, mm. the scars, the wounds of partition run very deeply within our identity, within our culture, mm. within our personal memories. Um, it's very obvious whenever there's a conflict between India and Pakistan, even if cricket matches, like the epitome of that yeah. rivalry, yeah. whereas the Northern Ireland, the troubles and then the current climate in Northern Ireland, like you said, it's a little bit ongoing. And with Brexit on the horizon, um, it's like there's a lot of confusion what's going to happen next. It, originally, we were like, with the partition, it's a happened event. We're looking at the effects of it. Mm. Whereas mm. The Irish this is an ongoing, ongoing, but now that the whole Kashmiri mm. situation has which happened, which is also an ongoing, ongoing scene of violence, which ebbs yep. and flows at, depending on the political climate. So we're just going to take a quick break here, and more on this when we return. We're also going to do some fun stuff, so you know, <laughs> bear with us. <laughs> Hi, welcome back to The Coffee Table. We've been having a really important and fascinating conversation about different kinds of partition that Irish people and Pakistanis have experienced. But now we're going to talk about fun stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lord, what has it been like being a white girl in Lahore? <laughs> where you're asking people about traumatic things that have happened to their families. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> it's been really exciting. Yeah. Um, it's such a different culture from Ireland, so it's been such a great experience. Yeah. And... Um, Girl and her family just treated me so well. I, I love the culture and I just l love the food. <laughs> I hope people haven't been gawking at you too much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Think know, it's like, we're very friendly, yeah. but we're also very curious. <laughs> it's been both uh, good and bad, on and off experience. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really glad she got to immerse herself in mm. the culture. That was one thing that was important to us, yeah. not just for the project, but for uh, understanding each other, we are very close friends. Yeah. So it was so much fun. We got, I got to introduce her to Lahore and Faisalabad and Pakistan and Inshallah Eid and everything. Yeah, you're going to be here for Eid. I know. That's wonderful. You're going to have so much good I'm eat. So excited. Lion store for yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> but Gomer, do you find it a sort of? Um, has it been challenging being able to sort of draw these stories out from people because again they come from a painful place. Yeah. And again, you know, you've got Lauren with you, who's obviously not, you know, a local. Yeah. And you are also an overseas Pakistani. Yeah. So, you know, people might assume that you're, you know, you're from here when they see you, but then obviously they hear your accent. And does yeah. that, so did you feel that it kind of makes them a little awkward? Rather than that, I was worried that I was intruding hmm. on something. I didn't want them yeah. to think I was, we didn't want them to think that we were just using their stories, so to mm. speak, mm. like for our own gain. Yeah. We wanted to be very respectful and we would always ask them if it was okay if they could tell us stories, like that it was their choice if they were comfortable. Mm -hmm. So I think we really wanted to make that obvious um, yeah. with our meetings with everybody. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, everybody wanted to share their stories. We Pakistanis really like to talk. It's true. It's true. <laughs> and I think maybe this is also maybe part of how we cope with things. Like yeah. you said, like in Northern Ireland, people use humor to cope with things. Punjabis do that a lot as well and maybe in a way like you know even with Freud you know the talking cure yeah. was a way to sort of it was therapy yeah. essentially so do you feel like it's therapeutic people find it therapeutic to sort of speak about terrible things yeah. and sad things but yeah. sort of do you feel like a sense of kinship with people afterwards like do you feel like since we're all in this yeah together? there's definitely this like idea of a collective identity mm. and this collective experience that um, as Pakistanis, we have this event that like draws us all together. And mm. somebody can tell me a story about their family and I would feel the same pain mm. that as I feel when my family tells me. And I think a lot of them really appreciated that we were highlighting this event and focusing on the trauma that they have gone through rather than glossing over it with historical facts and what the leaders were doing, not the normal people who were suffering the most. No. Um, 
And I think they were very glad to be able to share it as well. Because, like you said, talking cures, and they probably did feel like a little bit relieved that they are able to share that experience and share the knowledge with us as well. Yeah, yeah. And they were very happy to tell Lauren, especially. <laughs> sort of through a translator. Um, some of them felt um, comfortable enough to speak in English, but we obviously asked at the beginning what mm. they wanted to speak in. At the end of the interview, I, I just sit there and look at the camera and make sure everything's fine. And then once we've left, we go through the tapes and go translates for me. Because yeah, yeah. we felt it would just take away from... The immediacy the of it and people's sort of ability to kind yeah. of stay with the moment. Yeah, yeah. And that's where language is also really important. Yes. It's really interesting how the project is developing in these sort of multi-layered ways. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what it's going to be like when you guys go to Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. yeah. So away. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, time flies. <laughs> it's going to be kind of the same. I'm going to go and stay with her family, yeah. try and immerse myself in Irish mm. culture, learn their history through them, through their stories. Like we talked about, oral stories are very important. Yeah. And, um, and again, we come from a culture where a lot of, um, a fair amount of people aren't literate. So oral history and oral culture yeah. and storytelling. And there's a very ancient tradition yes. of, of uh, the bard yeah. that we have yeah. in this part of the world. I, mean, I think it's like a global thing. All cultures yeah. have a storytelling narrative kind of situation. So is that the same? Are there sort of uh, parallels there with um, a uh, lot Northern of, Ireland? A lot of uh, murals, so wall paintings. Mm -hmm. um, were put up throughout the Troubles. That okay. was a way of people yeah. instantly marking their territory Ooh, and like okay. saying their narrative, mm. like not through so like words. graffiti. Yes, and uh -huh. full scale um, paintings of um, activists and uh, people who kind of voice their opinion mm. through words, but they were voicing this narrative through imagery. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. And that's like the artist in you guys coming out. Yeah. <laughs> right. Because, you know, there was a lot of, for example, like re poetry and there was a lot of writing yeah. and the progressive writers movement kind yes, of yes, emerged yes. from all of this. But the, here you've got all this fantastic public art yeah. that is sort of highlighting the things that people, that is important to people. And I really find it really sort of touching that it's called the Troubles, the, the violent period in Ireland. It's yeah. called the Troubles. Yeah. <laughs> So it's like sad and succinct, but also so sort of direct at the same time. Yeah. So because um, we were under British rule throughout mm. it, um, a lot of the arts, like poetry and stuff, were actually kind of like censored without mm. like the art schools ah, okay. and the galleries funded mm. through the government um, just because they wouldn't want um, the, the slander, really. Mm. Um, so a so lot it's a sort of cultural control mm -hmm. happening in a very conscious way that, yeah. well, technically you can do what you like, but sort of through this filter. Yes, so people took to the streets and painted mm -hmm. their, the sides of their houses or the sides of their community oh, wow. centres. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of them still remain today. We actually um, have tours, so you can go on a bus and see like a lot of the ones that have been, like have just stayed up and um, it's very important yeah. to our culture. And see, that's yeah. the sort of interesting thing about an ongoing situation, mm. is how people are sort of finding ways to subvert oppressive power structures yep. in their own ways. That's fascinating. I'm really excited now. I'm sort of <laughs> what will be on the other side of this narrative? Because like you said, for us, partition is something that's happened. It's done. And this is how we're trying to sort of find different ways of yeah. dealing yeah. with the reverberations yes. of their trauma in our lives, in our sort of family or cultural history. But this is a sort of a, a live wire mm -hmm. that's sort of going back and forth. And what's interesting about Lauren's work in particular mm -hmm. is because it's an ongoing, highly politicized situation, her own work is quite political. Mm -hmm. And we've often heard comments where people have said, oh, it's too controversial, even for university uh, standard really? work. Really? Tell me something about that. Tell me about one of your favorite projects. Um, I created a, a video piece. Um, I use a lot of found footage. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what is found footage? Just so, so people do sort of... Uh, footage that have already aired, so like from documentaries mm. or like news um, segments. Mm. So I use a lot Shows of Shows like the... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So things that I find on the internet that yeah. kind of um, interest me and a lot of like really violent clips, I kind of subvert it with like pop culture so mm -hmm. that people want to laugh but then are uncomfortable 
and they kind of engage with it more because mm. there's so many layers to it. Yeah. Um, so on the on the outside, it looks familiar because you're referencing something that sort of everybody knows, and yeah. it's not a sort of scary or violent or threatening thing. But then it's like surprise. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the basis of my work. Yeah. Um, just to ignite these conversations mm. of um, things that people are happily to be in blissful ignorance. Um, mm which would be nice to live in <laughs> but um but we can't afford ignorance yeah. anymore yeah. and i really feel like the way that the world is changing and with our access to information outside of newspapers and and sort of state television channels and things like that um we know more and do you feel like our responsibility yeah. has increased as well now to sort of voice yes give a voice to trauma and give a voice to violence and give a voice to situations that are happening that you are directly experiencing that's mm -hmm. Can't be more authentic than that. Mm. Especially with the rise of social media. Mm. Um, Kashmir is so well documented on social yes. media. Would we have known in the Western cities if this was happening? Mm. If it was just newspapers and news outlets or like what would be the dialogue? Yeah. Whereas we get, um, now we get so many perspectives and we were lucky enough to interview uh, people across like different um, occupations and mm -hmm. That gave us so many different views on the one thing. Um, it gave a really personal touch, and yeah. you could just see how it affected people so differently, and how the views have changed throughout time. Yes, the views have changed as well. In in what way? As I'm, in, I'm sure it's early days now, but you're yes. sort of getting a sense of that. Well, I mean, as some of the people that we've interviewed have lived through the earlier Kashmir incidents, mm. mm. various. Um, political situations or like and again the same way that it used to be a much more porous border and people yeah. were still able to go back and yeah. forth but then again as sort of tensions ebb and flow the controls sort of change as well yes yeah, so some some of the interviewees think oh um india uh, they've occupied kashmir but they're not going to go for they're not going to move to pakistan it's fine we're fine yeah. whereas others are like no they're coming for us we have to be prepared we're coming they're coming for us yeah. and then some people have said that they personally believe that they don't believe in borders they don't believe in a certain identity per se like for a country mm. as long they believe in the collective yeah. and um that was a very interesting perspective it mm. was that person focused more on the fact that we got our freedom from the British rather than we were separated. Ah, so okay. And that's interesting because it's sort of, it's a, it's a post-nationalist kind of narrative. And yeah. again, and sort of, there's a lot of talk about, you know, being a global citizen as well. Yeah. I mean, look at you, we've got an Irish girl sitting here in Pakistan talking about partition. Yeah. And it's still relevant for us and it makes sense. And I'm sure when you go there, there will be so many things that sort of leap out at you. And in, yeah. in so many ways, we have this, we're living a shared experience in so many different ways. Yeah. And I think that this kind of, you know, art bringing, and I love that you guys are using your art to kind of bring uh, uh, politics and bring activism and bring sort of, it's, it's incredibly hopeful for yeah. me. And thank you so much, both of you, for being on the show and talking about your wonderful project. And we're very excited to see it. Thank you so much and, you know, for having best us. Of luck. So much. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you guys yeah. for watching. If you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe, as you know. Mm -hmm. And when their film comes out, we'll let you know so that we can all watch it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. You guys have been great. We'll see you next time.